There we go. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, White Buffalo series. I uh, uh, really appreciate you uh, tuning in. It's uh, This is the first time I've ever, I've ever done anything with um, all my White Buffalo material, so uh, it's, uh, it's a first for me. Up until now, uh, my relationship uh, with White Buffalo has been just, you know, very personal, very private, always has been, really. But uh, over the years, uh, what, what we know is the energy or the uh, form of White Buffalo has been uh, one of my one of my greatest teachers here on the planet. And uh, uh, so this is going to be a very different kind of talk about uh, White Buffalo, if any of you are familiar with the Native American um, version on it. Uh, this will not be so much Native American as universal. Uh, because this is the way White Buffalo came to me. Um, and uh, this first session is going to be very interesting. I'm going to tell you some very interesting stories uh, about the relationship, and then we're going to get into a couple of really neat things here, uh, Into the Rainbow and Tears of Joy, which I think you'll find very interesting. But um, I, I, I always call the White Buffalo material adventure. It's an adventure. It's always been an adventure. Um, for me, uh, it all began, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'll, I'll preface it by saying this, I, uh, I was born in North Carolina of, uh, uh, and had Cherokee blood in me, but then almost everybody in North Carolina does, actually. Um, but um, uh, I had, my grandfather was uh, a full-blooded Cherokee, although I never knew him very well because we never lived very close to him. But um, uh, in these areas in the Carolinas, it's very big to talk about your Native American heritage, and everybody says they're part Cherokee at least. And um, so, uh, and I used to wonder when I was young, uh, my uh, my Native American friends would kind of laugh if you brought up the fact that you were part Cherokee. And finally, um, finally, I, I, one day I, I asked one of my friends, "Well, why why do, why do you always?" These guys laugh when a, when, a, when a white person says they're part Cherokee, and the answer was very interesting. The answer was that the Cherokees, you know, were, uh, had a full uh, language and writing, and they had an alphabet and everything when the white man showed up, and they were very, um, uh, very open to assimilation. And so uh, my friend said the Cherokees are also the best lovers on the planet, and so they made love to everybody. So when you say you're part Cherokee, we go, yeah, we know it. <laughs> the Cherokee men and women are the best lovers on the planet. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but um, uh, when I was a child, um, uh, and, and you know, I, I knew my grandfather, uh, uh, you know, not that well, but I would stay with him sometimes in the summer and whatever. But but he didn't live. Um, on the reservation, so to speak, although he was one of the elders, but um, I uh, kept bugging my mother, and so when we were young, my mother took uh, my brother and I up to the main Cherokee reservation in North Carolina, and uh, my mother said, it, it, I embarrassed her so bad, because the minute I jumped out the car, I started going around saying, where are the Indians, where are the Indians, I want to see the Indians, I guess I expected them to look like what I saw in the, uh, in the cowboy movies, and uh, things like that, so, uh, but I was so surprised that they weren't going around in feathers and everything predominantly at that time. So uh, uh, that was kind of my first experience on the reservation. But um, so I didn't, uh, after that, you know, once I, I left home and began my life, I never really thought about being Native American or even part Native American or, or anything like that. Uh, just, just wasn't in my consciousness. But um, uh, after my near-death experience, a lot of things changed. And um, uh, uh, this was a, a very good one for me. And my story with uh, my White Buffalo experience begins on uh, August 20th, 1994, when, when the first White Buffalo of this era was born. And her name, by the way, was Miracle. And so uh, that began a miracle in my life. Uh, I, I want you to understand that uh, from my understanding and my relationship with the White Buffalo uh, woman and the feminine energy is that um, it's, 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 uh, she is, for me, the Kuan Yin, the Mother Mary of the West. And uh, each country, I mean, each uh, section of the world has these Mother Mary figures, these mother figures. And um, so that's how I look at this. I don't look at it as like a buffalo or a particular person. This is a, an energy form that is ancient, uh, has a great lineage, and uh, is, uh, is it's, it's a miracle that it's happening in our lifetime, actually, and right on time, by the way, when we do need uh, regeneration.
regeneration, because she stands for regeneration, miracles, um, uh, abundance in a way that uh, the white people don't understand, abundance of, of uh, peace and, and energy, not abundance of money and things like that. And so um, for me, it began on August 20th, 1994, which is the day that um, uh, the first white buffalo was born. And uh, I wasn't even thinking about this, had not been thinking about it, didn't even know. Um, I just wasn't into this at all, just hadn't come across my, uh, my interest at that time. So I had no inkling at all. All I know is that one morning I was living in a little cabin in, in, uh, uh, next to a national park in California. And one morning I got up to do some reading and uh, this energy came and filled my whole body and uh, immediately uh, announced herself as White Buffalo and started channeling right through me. I started writing immediately and have written many, many things uh, channeled from White Buffalo uh, below these many years, since since 94. Uh, most of which, as I've said, I've kept private because uh, a lot of life experience is really for you. It's not really meant to be books or, uh, or make you famous or make you a lot of money or anything. The best experiences are really for you. And I think some of us lose track of that when we do have a magical experience. It was really for you. And I've always looked at it that way. But um, for me, the first thing that uh, uh, White Buffalo Woman started channeling to me was called the miracle of life. And um, uh, I've touched on these little things a little bit here and there in some of my talks and whatever. But, but uh, what came through to me was this, uh, this peace and this joy and this regenerative feeling uh, that was quite amazing. And um, so one of the first things that she uh, channeled for me was about miracles. And, uh, and the information was like this. Uh, basically, she said, why does modern man, man of the West especially, why does modern man think there are few miracles or few and far in between when they're not? The entire universe is a miracle. You know, talk to any scientist, it's a miracle the universe is even here. Uh, it, it had to be so perfectly balanced to, for us to even be here. The universe could have gone very fast and we wouldn't have time to evolve, or it could have, uh, it could have taken too long. It's, uh, it's been perfect for us and uh, this type of consciousness to evolve. So the whole universe is a miracle, and your life is a miracle. The life that came out of this universal experience is a miracle. And so, um, all I've ever, all I've ever learned from her is to bless things, not curse things. Um, and she says things to me like this: Why wait and pray for miracles? Why, why wait and pray for miracles when you have the power and the gift to create miracles on a regular basis? You have the gift and the power to create magic, and miracles are real magic. So, modern man um, needs to make time for miracles and magic, to make the space, a sacred space, for miracles and magic to happen, and to make ceremony. Ceremony really anchors it in and is a, a sacred part of the entire experience. Uh, she encourages us to be a motive force, to be the focus for universal potential. And that's just uh, an amazing message. Uh, she's never condemned anybody or anything, even hypocrites. Uh, and we may get into that at some point about what she said about hypocrites. But um, I've just been, it, it, this, 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 this incredible feminine energy has just been a big part of my life ever since. And um, I call it the adventure because with me it has been an adventure. And she's been quite, quite uh, uh, playful, although um, uh, some of the stuff that we, we go through in life is quite serious, but if you look at it in a more playful mode or with a little bit of humor, it, it makes it a lot easier to get through some of the things that, that uh, can happen to us in this life. Um, now, I'm going to tell you a few stories to kind of give you an idea, a flavor of what my relationship is like. My relationship is not like the traditional Native American shaman relationship. Um, uh, with uh, with the white buffalo woman energy, it has uh, been something um, for me, and um, I have grown with it. She has been a great advisor to me, uh, even in business. She's given me some great business advice occasionally, but just the sense of how to deal.
deal with beings uh, that I would have to be dealing with. And uh, she's given me many adventures in my life, and they're always a surprise. I, I never know when to expect them. I never know when they're going to happen. But um, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. One of the first was um, I was uh, at that time married to my first wife, who was quite a magical person, and we were both really getting into this uh, white buffalo woman energy. And uh, this was shortly after um, the, the initial uh, experience. And uh, she guided us to do uh, a meditation together one day. And we held hands, we did a meditation together, and we both had the same vision. And the vision was uh, past life as Native Americans before the white man ever came here in, uh, in the uh, Northwest uh, or um, uh, up around Minnesota area. And um, uh, we were, uh, I was part of a, of a, of a tribe and uh, I, was, uh, I was an orphan. And my, what I call my grandmother really wasn't uh, related to me blood-wise at all. She was the, um, she was the um, uh, shaman of the of the uh, tribe or of the group and she was uh, at that time very uh, really old and snaggled tooth and pretty ugly the ugly character and she had taken on to herself though to adopt the um, the orphans uh, because things were always happening um, you know, there was always skirmishes and and uh, raids of, of tribes and things going on um, uh, it was still a very dangerous time in many ways but uh, so uh, my first wife and I were meditating and we picked up on this. We both had this vision of a, of a past life with this woman we called grandmother. And uh, it was very vivid. We remember being with her. There were, she had a number of children that she took care of. And she seemed to be mean and, 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 you know, and kind of gruff and angry all the time and snaggled tooth. And, and, but we loved her. But she was hard on us. She wanted us to be self-reliant. And uh, she, um, but she was good to us. And um, we, uh, she, she would, um, she would make jokes to us sometimes. Like we, we, we had these dogs that she let us keep, and she would, she would make, she would say things like, "You treat these dogs, you treat these dogs better than me," you know, and things like that. And uh, then one, one evening, it was a full moon. One evening, our village uh, was attacked by another tribe, raided. And it was brutal. It was quite brutal. Many were killed. Many ran away and tried to save their lives. Um, it was quite brutal. And um, there was screaming and, and death and, and terror and uh, all in this full moon. And I remember um, her trying to hide us under her uh, skins where she slept. And uh, uh, she was killed that night. She was killed outright. And luckily they didn't look where she was sitting. She was actually sitting on us. And uh, other children had been killed and, or, or kidnapped and uh, people had been killed. And, uh, and then the raid was over and we were left totally in shock. And uh, it was after that that um, uh, we were raised, uh, we, we were raised still in, in the village, but they changed my name at that point to Wounded Moon. Because I, I had been actually wounded when they were they were hacking at her, uh, I had actually been wounded with one of the hits missed and wounded me on the shoulder. And uh, to this day, I have a, a scar I was born with on that shoulder. Uh, kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, but but uh, we survived, and um, but we remembered we remembered that she'd always said that she was going to come back. And this is before she ever died. She she, she would make jokes with us in her way. And she said, uh, I'm going to come back one day as your dog because you treat these dogs better than me. I will come back as your dog one day. And we used to laugh, you know, ha, ha, ha. But part of this meditation and vision was that, uh, that my first wife and I were, were looking and feeling because my first wife was my sister in that life. We weren't blood related. She was one of the orphans that had been adopted by um, our grandmother shaman. And uh, she was technically um, a sister. And um, we, 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 really, we really kind of resonated on that level in, in some ways. And then when the meditation was over, White Buffalo clearly said, we both heard it, time to go collect your grandmother now. And we both saw that it, we, it was time to go 
go look for a dog. We, uh, we weren't looking for a dog. We didn't have a dog at the time. And so uh, I jumped right up. My wife was a little hesitant, you know, a dog, come on now. And so uh, I said, no, we got to do this now. Now's the time we've been told to go do it. And so the first thing we did was go around to shelters uh, looking for the dog. And we were, you know, I was told to look in the dog's eyes. I was told to hold it like a baby. I was told what to do. And uh, we spent, you know, half the day going to shelters and things like that. And then kind of gave up, didn't find any, any animal that we uh, resonated with. And then on the way home, we passed a pet shop that said puppies for sale, and I just got a hit. It's, I said, let's go in there. Let's, let's, we have to go in there. We went in, and uh, there, were, uh, there, there were lots of little puppies, but there was this little pet of puppies of mixed breed, and the mixed breed was uh, half Doberman and half uh, Black Lab, which to this day, I believe, is an incredible mix. You get the brain and the heart. It was just an amazing mix. But anyway... So, um, so uh, it was a very comfortable place to be in, in the pet shop. And they opened up the little gate and the little pen they had in and the puppies came out. You know, about five or six of them came out, uh, all little black things, very tiny. And uh, we wanted to see who would come over to us. And um, uh, puppies were running around doing their things. And one came right over, over to me and sat in my lap. And then I picked it up and held it like a baby. And it was like, I'm home. I looked in its eyes, and it looked, looked me straight in the eyes. There was contact. And I said, uh, this is the dog. And uh, they, uh, they wanted 50 bucks for it. Okay, great. So uh, took the dog home, and uh, this, this tiny little mix, Black Lab and, and uh, Doberman. And um, we were then instructed to do some ceremonies, because we were told that it's very possible for an advanced shaman to come back as anything they want to come back as. But it's also very tricky. You better be a master when you try this stuff because you can, you can really mess it up. And uh, so we were told that her spirit would not enter this dog until we did ceremony because um, that, was, that was the way she would be sure. This was, this was the right time and place to be. And so uh, we made a blanket out in the backyard, and we, we played with the puppy, and we did ceremony. And uh, the dog fell asleep right in front of us. And what Buffalo said, um, you hold, the, you hold uh, the back feet, and your wife holds the front feet. She's coming in. It was amazing. She came in. Just the spirit came into this dog. And... Uh, turned out to be just the most incredible experience with a dog I've ever had. And those of you that have pets kind of know what I mean when you really bond with one. And the first thing she did when she got up, she just, she just, when the spirit was in, she just jumped straight up like an electric bolt. And uh, I was, uh, I, uh, I then picked up my Native American drum and was uh, tapping on it. And she came right over and grabbed the drumstick and took it away from me and started playing with it. And I still have that today with her teeth marks in it. And that began this great adventure that lasted 16 years with this, with this, with this uh, beautiful animal who was my grandmother from a past life, a shaman. And um, we would joke with her. She, she, you could, like, talk to this dog, and you didn't have to yell at it or anything. You could talk to it. And we would make jokes with her. We would say, you're right, uh, and by the way, this incarnation as a dog is your most beautiful incarnation you've ever had. And it was. If you'd ever seen her in the past life, this was the most beautiful incarnation she ever had. And all of her teeth were good, too. So uh, it began this very long relationship and a very magical relationship. And um, out of that um, came a whole concept of reincarnating pets because... At a certain point, when she was like four years old, um, uh, White Buffalo said, it's, it's time to, have, uh, to let her have some babies. And we did. And uh, she, had, uh, she had 12 teats, and she had 12 babies. And each one of them were stunning, and each one different, because we were told just to let her out the door, let her go pick. And uh, I guess my little girl did every point in the neighborhood because you could tell who the fathers were from the, from the uh, look of the dogs, and, the, and we knew the neighbor dogs and things like that. But out of nowhere, 
and I was, um, I'm someone that never wanted to be near birth or placentas and things like that, and I had arranged to have friends um, uh, uh, come and do the delivery, but she, she started delivering before my friends could get there, and it took them about an hour to get there, so I now know more about placenta and cutting, uh, cutting uh, uh, cords and everything than I ever cared to know, but, but in delivering those puppies right in the middle of the six, she she pushed out two twins, two white dogs, and immediately white buffalo said to me, "These are your white buffaloes." And I kept those two dogs, and they were the most magnificent dogs. They were the reincarnations of two of the most favorite dogs I've ever had in my life. Because we've, we've been a family since I was a child of having dogs, and I knew who these dogs were. She gave me back these two dogs. And uh, and they they and and they knew their they just had the same traits they they had the same games they liked to play and it was just a beautiful beautiful adventure um, that lasted all their lives. So talk about adventures. Now the other thing that White uh, Buffalo likes to do to me is get me lost. And this has happened many times, and I've been many friends that have been with me in these kind of adventures because these adventures are never announced. Um, and they usually come on like this. I want to go somewhere. I know where I'm going. I've probably been there before. And I get in the car with a friend or whatever, and I start going. And uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I was uh, going to go have dinner at a friend's house um, in, in uh, the mountain near, near where I live. And I've been there before, knew where the place was, no problem. Well, I get to talking with uh, my uh, first wife. We get to talking, have an interesting conversation suddenly it dawns on me that we're lost. I don't know where we are, and now we're in the mountains. Well, I, I, I thought I knew these mountains by heart, but we're lost, and we became hopelessly lost, and getting low on gas, and I start getting frustrated. This is how it usually happens. I get so lost, I get so frustrated about finding my way to where I'm going, and I thought I knew where I was going, and, um, uh, and then about that moment, about the peak of that anxiety, uh, I suddenly realized, oh, this is a white buffalo thing. And I stop the car wherever I am, and I just calm down and tune in. And I'll give you this example. This night we were going to have friend, uh, dinner with friends in the mountains. Um, we got so lost, didn't know where we were, didn't recognize anything. And um, uh, white buffalo said, um, just go to the next house. The next house that has a light on, go into their driveway, knock on the door. You need to meet these people. Now, isn't that kind of wild and bold? Well, uh, having, having had these adventures before, and I still have them, by the way, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my first wife and I drove, and we saw the first house with a light on it. And by the way, the house looked like a Thomas Kincaid painting, if you've ever seen those. It was a magical cottage with this light on. And so we looked at each other, and we got out of the car, we went and knocked on the door, and uh, uh, this beautiful elderly lady came to the door, and we explained to her that we've gotten lost, and, and uh, our spirit guide told us to stop here, and she just looked at us like, mm, okay, fine, well, come on in. So we went in and uh, uh, met her husband, an elderly gentleman, and it turned out that they were very, very well-known master artist puppet makers. And they were in this little Thomas Kincaid kind of cabin thing. It was like too much. It was like right out of a movie. And um, in our conversation with them and having tea with them, uh, it came about that her husband actually had, had uh, an ailment uh, that I actually could help him with with my light technology. And so I brought it up. They said, bring it on, and we became friends, and it did really help her husband. And uh, so you never know how these adventures go. This, is, this has been my kind of um, uh, relationship. It's been a very adventurous, uh, very fun, although I've been through some scary things with her that she's helped me get through. But um, in the end, um, it's been very, very magical. The other thing that I've learned from uh, White Buffalo is ceremony. Like, I was never really into ceremony before this, before this uh, period. And um, so many of us try to set up ceremonies, try to pre-plan them, try to get everything right, the moon, the 
objects, you name it, the right the incense is the sage here. You know, we try to we, we really try to uh, get a little too much mental about it. Um, she she taught me right from the very beginning that she wants new ceremonies now. The the old traditional ceremonies are fine and nothing wrong with them, but she's really about new ceremonies now. A new ceremony for a new time, and she loves to use this magical substance in her ceremonies is very magical. She calls it scratch. That's right, scratch. And for, for those of you that don't know what that word is, scratch usually means when you come into a kitchen and you're just going to make something on the spot, you will use whatever you have in the kitchen. That's called making it from scratch. And that's what that's her favorite kind of ceremony. You, 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 you receive it's time to do a ceremony. Um, you stop where you are, you use available materials, and you make a ceremony. And it's been very creative, very freeing to uh, do these new kinds of ceremonies. And, and the thing about new ceremonies is that some of them are just for the moment, like, like doing art on the beach and then the waves erase them, that's fine. Others, though, that you will develop in your life, these new ceremonies are things you might want to make a tradition in your life or with your group also. New traditions also can begin. And so um, I've had so much fun doing ceremony and learning about ceremony from uh, a white buffalo woman. Um, it's just been fantastic. Um, and I'll, I'll be you know, sharing much more of this as now I open up, because like I said at the beginning, this is the first time I've really talked about my, uh, my adventures and my relationship with uh, white buffalo woman energy. Um, now, I'm going to go on to the next subject, which is um, called the end of the rainbow. And uh, this is, um, you talk about synchronicity in life. Um, uh, I have, uh, since, since a kid, I always thought it was very, very funny that you would have these images of uh, rainbows at the end of the rainbow as a leprechaun and a pot of gold. I always thought that was very interesting. Um, but only when I moved to California and only in this area that I moved to in Monterey Bay, that I get to see the most spectacular rainbows of my life, even to this day. Um, there's something about this area. I have been driving down the highway going to Monterey on a day and seen double, full-blown rainbows that were so stunning that literally, and, and, and I've taken pictures of this, literally so stunning that people on the road would just, everybody pulls over stop and watch this and it's like we're all standing out there in awe like come to Jesus time or something if, if this is if this is the rapture I'm ready <laughs> kind of moments uh, uh, and all my travels around the world being in a military family and, and whatever I've, I've seen a lot of things but never rainbows like this and then to top it off um, I moved to an area uh, that is well known for the end of the rainbows. I didn't know that. But I can tell you, I have literally physically been to the end of a rainbow a number of times since I've been here. It's something about the area, something about that you can go and stand right at the end at the end of a rainbow and be in this glow. It's so magical. Of course it keeps moving. It it moves as it doesn't just stay still. But I've taken pictures of this. Um, I've chased rainbows, and I have stood at the end of stood in the end of a rainbow a number of times since I've been in California in this area. And the interesting thing about standing at the in, in the end of a rainbow is I didn't see any leprechauns, and there was no, no pot of gold. <laughs> there was only the magical moment. Um, that was something you'll never forget, and uh, and and it's it's quite wonderful. So, um, what White Buffalo has taught me is that the end of the rainbow is the time that we're all coming to now. The end of the rainbow is kind of a symbol in this, in, in, in the way that I'm uh, uh, talking about, is a kind of a symbol of the end of childhood. And the human race is the youngest species uh, on planet Earth. And we are uh, not, we're just beginning to mature as a species on planet Earth. We're not even a mature species yet. Um, and uh, at some point in evolution, uh, species have to um, earn their, their right to be here. And humans are getting to that point now where we've gotten so big on the planet that we're a major influence on the planet. And we have to justify our existence from this time on if we're going to stay here and enjoy this planet. 
planet as humans. The planet can go on without us and probably come up with something else, I'm sure, as she's done many times in the past. But there's something special about human beings that this planet loves, that this planet's been working on and trying to get us to this point, because human beings are the sum total of life on this planet. Not, not that we're the kings and not that we're better than anything else. It's just that we are the kind of the sum total of all of evolution to this moment. And we are also the star child potential. We are the human body and the human mind is going to build technologies and see things that the hawk has never seen, that the snake has never known, that the wolf has never heard. And only in this type of body and only in this type of consciousness can we create systems that will allow us to starseed other planets. And this is why when I speak to nature, I, everything loves us. Everything is for us. Because we are like Noah's Ark. We will take life and Gaia everywhere that we go because we are that. We are the life of Gaia. And we will take all of this with us when we go. And so the end of the rainbow is really about sort of the end of childhood. We have to grow up now. I think many of you understand that. And, and you can remember, uh, I remember back when you were very young and still living at home and didn't have to pay bills and things like that. And then there comes a time, as in my family, uh, we were all expected to leave the minute we graduated high school, one way or the other. And in fact, uh, my graduation gift was a traveling bag, and uh, I was expected to be out, and we were. But I remember um, going from being um, days of leisure and not having to worry about bills and stuff like that, going into a life where I didn't even know how to do a bank account, I uh, had to pay the rent now, and all that was kind of depressing when I got out on my own, but then I got a grip on it and life became better and better uh, as you get a grip on it. Well, <clears throat> the end of the rainbow uh, is a symbol of us maturing as a species. It's really time we grew up and time that <clears throat> we, we acted as mature adults. And in all of the universe, even the Big Bang, uh, the beginnings, the baby stage is one of the shortest stages you'll ever be in. Um, the Big Bang was a very short stage, and we're now in the more mature universe stage now. Same thing with uh, growing up. Um, we, we grow up, we mature into it. Your, your childhood and your infant uh, days are, uh, are the shortest time you, you'll have. You're going to spend most of your life as mature as a mature being. And... Uh, and so the more you get a grip on, on growing up and being more responsible, because when you're children, and, and we see this in the world today, we see this in the world around us, children are greedy, they're, uh, children are, we're all animals, but children are more connected to that at, at young age than we are at, at our age. But, um, so children fight over cookies. Some kids want all the cookies, and some kids cry about it, some kids spill milk. All of that, it doesn't mean the human race is going to grow up to be, you know, terrible beings. Um, uh, the guy who doesn't look at us that way. But, but when you're in your childhood stage, it's all about me, 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 me. And isn't that what we see when we look around at uh, everything that we see now? It's become more and more me, 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 me. And that's one way to find yourself. But in the end, sharing and uh, loving and working things out without wars is where we're going. And so the end of the rainbow really is a mark of time that is both um, sad in a way and takes some courage to grow up. It takes courage to be mature and to be responsible. And uh, as, as we look around, we're not even responsible voters. I mean, uh, we, we kind of have the leaders we deserve, you know. Um, we need to be more responsible now, and, and the human race is big enough and such an influence on the, on the planet that each and every one of us needs to grow up and become responsible at this time in history um, for the future that is coming. And, and we're doing that. I, I have no doubt. It's nine, there's a 95% chance that we're going to pull this off. There's very little chance we won't pull this off because the species is maturing at a ra rapid rate now. That, that maturing means that we, we should hold our leaders accountable. We have to be a motive force. Um, and so the more responsible we become in our lives and the more responsible we are with our resources, the more we tend to want our governments to be that way, want our corporations to be that way. We're, we really 
are living in the end times of the old industrial era where corporations could own everything, governments, kings, you know, the planet, the resources. That, that time is passing now. <clears throat> Things like public banking. Um, all kinds of new systems are coming in now that are going to put banks out of business and going to put uh, large corporations as we know them out of business because it, it just can't go on. We know that. And besides that, as you know from my uh, Gaia talk or, or DVD, between 2020 and 2060, we're going to see the, the largest die-off of human beings the planet has ever known, strictly due to aging, nothing else. No conspiracies, no diseases, no raptures, just aging uh, as we age. And so there's going to be, the future is very different now, if you want to study it from a demographic point of view, very different than what we know now, where corporations are out of control, Wall Street, these people have no moral code whatsoever except to take everything and ruin it. And if we let them, then we're not being an adult, mature species on planet Earth. So that's the part of growing up. And yeah, it does take a little bit of work. Um, there are people out there that uh, don't have the time or the interest to be involved. And I say, fine, don't feel guilty about that because there's millions and millions and millions of us who are ready, who are ready to grow up, who are ready to be responsible. And when you become more responsible, you you actually look at karma in a different way. You know, karma has debts just like your finances. Are you in debt? We need to watch our karma just like we would try to watch our debt situation, our credit situation. Uh, it's that real. And so these are the things that adults do. Children, if you give a child a bag of cookies, they will usually eat all the cookies so they get sick. That's what we have in the corporations and, and the giant money of today. Uh, but as an adult, you can, you can usually, uh, if you're not obsessive, I, I don't go to either extreme, I try to go right down the middle. Uh, most adults can keep a bag of cookies for a while. Uh, and we don't have to eat it all at one time. And most adults don't fight nearly as much as kids do, or, and bigger, honestly, no matter what you're seeing on the news. But, um, so as we mature, karma changes uh, the, the way we, did you know that if the, uh, uh, this is why I love consumer unions, if you join a consumer union, when you walk into a store, you can feel like one of the most powerful people on earth. When you want, if you're if you're part of a consumer union, and they're going to get bigger and bigger now because this is the part of us consumers. The consumers have been almost completely irresponsible up to this point, putting up with anything they shove at us in any price and any any way they want to do it to us. But in the end, if you join a consumer union and you walk into a store as I do, and I, I walk into a store and I go, okay, who am I going to make rich today? Because I think of myself times millions of consumers. And I don't support bad companies, and I don't uh, I don't go by a lot of conspiracies. Well, when I when I really when I really boycott somebody, I really do. I really check it out myself and make sure it's just not internet, you know, thing, uh, a virus thing going on that people do <clears throat> with each other. But but literally, uh, one of the most important things we can do right now is become responsible consumers and join a consumer union. There are many of them. Check it out. Uh, this is the great power of the future. Um, and so uh, with a consumer union and the bigger and more organized we're going to get, we could put a large corporation out of business overnight if we just stop buying their stuff, you know. Um, but uh, are you in debt to that bank? Does that bank hold your mortgage? We, it gets weird when you start trying to straighten out your karma, doesn't it? I hate that bank, but gosh, they have my mortgage. So this is why we have become smarter and more... Um, In other words, 
generations as Native Americans would think about it. Take this idea you have, seven generations in the future, and how does it look then? You know, uh, that's how you should look at these things. And a lot of these uh, secret courses and all this stuff, if you really take it to the end, and, and say everybody took this course on planet Earth and everybody did that, could everybody be a millionaire? Could everybody have mansions? Could everybody build Taj Mahals? No. The planet could not possibly sustain that philosophy. So, uh, so there's something, something in between that's a lot more sustainable and makes more sense in the future. The future that I've seen is a future in which there's actually less consumerism and things last longer. You might even be driving your grandfather's car and loving it. Um, but um, the future I've seen is one in which all, uh, all of us regular folks, all of us regular folks actually get an increase in lifestyle, an increase in comfort, an increase in health. Um, once we, uh, once we get, uh, you know, these uh, kings, priests, and thieves that keep robbing everything from us. Uh, but uh, the future is something where we all have a much higher lifestyle, a very comfortable lifestyle, and a very healthy uh, way of being. And it doesn't mean you have to eat health foods or yogurt or anything like that. It's not about that. So that's what the end of the rainbow is about that White Buffalo has been, uh, you know, teaching me for years now. And um, the next thing is, and this is a very important time that we're in, um, how many of you have ever been through trials and tribulations? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, every once in a while you'll get somebody in the group, it's not me, my life's been perfect. I go, oh boy, okay. Next. But um, for most of us, life is a, has a, until we become uh, fully conscious and mature as a being and control our karma and our debts better and things like that and think about who we love and who we marry and all this. We've got to think about all this stuff a bit deeper now into the future. We, we will tend to have trials and tribulations, um, both self-generated, family-generated, uh, government-generated. You know, these things are, are, are just a part of life. What the tears of joy is about is that, um, um, and is what my buffalo has taught me, is that what we're forgetting about all this stuff is the miracle of life. The miracle of life. Uh, our nine to five jobs, our, our, everything that we have to go through every day tends to keep you away from realizing that your life, no matter what job you have, no matter how much money you have or don't have, is a miracle. And once you start making that a part of your daily mantra, that this life is a miracle, I'm living in a miracle, that I don't have to be a millionaire, I don't have to be a movie star, I don't have to be famous, um, you know, I, I don't have to have 20 cars. Um, once you get past all that, and, and so many people, especially in America, feel that way. If you're not famous, you're nobody. And if you've got a good idea and haven't made any money at it, then it isn't a good idea. There, most ideas don't make money. Most good ideas don't make money, in fact. I, you know, I've seen this as an inventor, but they're good ideas and they help the world. Um, Tears of Joy is really about taking a look back at your life uh, the life you've lived, and in just a moment, and, and this is something I try to do almost every day, is resolve my issues with my past, not anybody else's past, my past, my life, the things that I regret, the things that uh, I regret that people have done to me, because uh, my life has certainly been full of trials and tribulations, because uh, I've been out there a lot doing a lot of things, and uh, I have more chance to get into these things than the average person home, but to look back on your life and start resolving these issues, not intellectually, because that's never quite going to work. You have to resolve them emotionally, is what White Buffalo has taught me, and she calls this the tears of joy, and um, I'll put it this way, uh, the miracle of life is just, just focus on that, meditate on that, fill your life with that, and what you'll find is, is what she tells me, and I've experienced is, the beauty of it all is that when you really get it, you're going to love it. And that's why you might, uh, you might see people that have, uh, lots of people have already got this, they may not have to go through it the, uh, the white buffalo way that I did. But I can tune in to my past, to my life, my mistakes, my betrayals that have happened to me, the uh, sabotages. I've had it all happen. And I can never resolve all that stuff. It's, it's, it's history. It, it happened to me. It affected my life. It's hurt me. And 
I've been betrayed, belittled, I've been abandoned. I've had all that that most of us have been through. But we can't dwell on that. And when I can look around and look at it and realize the miracle of life and the beauty of it all, all I have to show for it are these tears of joy. And the ancient Egyptians and other cultures used to collect their tears. In the Egyptian museums, there's these little uh, vase, vases, little glass vases, where the people would catch their tears, and they would catch their tears of joy, and they would save them in a little vial. Did you know research has shown that when you cry, when you cry sad, you're releasing 40-some enzymes from your body. That's why you feel better. You're releasing toxins through your tears. But when you do a chemical analysis of your tears of joy, it's like a mood alterer. And that's why the Egyptians and other cultures have saved their tears of joy. And so when they're feeling down and out, they'll go take a little drop of that on their tongue. I do this. And also, when you have these tears of joy, don't be afraid to touch them and put them on your tongue. This is medicine. The tears of joy. And you don't have to intellectualize it. You don't have to do years of therapy. And it's just something that you'll have to do on a regular basis. Because one of the great rules of the universe is the universe loves memory. How many times have you tried to clear something through whatever kind of therapy? And you get clear for a little while, then it all comes back again. How many times? Well, that's because you're trying to clear the memory. Nature, the entire universe, loves memory. It doesn't want to lose any memory at all. That's called evolution. But what you can do <clears throat> is change the charge on that memory with tears of joy. You'll never, get, you'll never forget these things that have happened to you. They will always be around in your experience. But when you change the charge on them, they become medicine. They become lessons. And then when you stop repeating the same mistakes, you are on the first step to wisdom. And so I encourage you to look back at your life. Identify with whatever has caused you pain, what you've done to others, what others have done to you. And get in touch with it. And then say, all I have to show for it at this moment are these tears of joy. And it is medicine. It is great medicine. So, White Buffalo tells me that we should become a blessing to the world. Become a blessing to this world. Don't curse anything. Bless everything. Bless everything you do. Everything you are. Everything you see, bless everything you hear, bless everything you feel, everything you touch, bless everything, and you change, you, you change your aura even. Go around blessing, blessing, blessing. And she taught me a little trick that I, I think is fun. How many of you have found lucky pennies? And of course, they have to be really shiny, and they have to have heads up, of course, to be lucky. Um, but. She says, just like with the original blessing, why wait? Why pray for miracles? Why wait to find a lucky penny? What I do now is I, I get some shiny pennies from the bank or whatever, and I create, she taught me to create lucky pennies. So when I'm meditating and I get this bliss and I get this joy, I hold these pennies and I bless them with that energy. And then when I go around town or whatever, I leave these in little spots for people to find. That's how it works. You don't have to wait. You can be proactive. Uh, you can create lucky pennies and other things like this in your life. Um, so these are very important things to remember and practice. And that's a, that's a load right there to just kind of digest. I would like to read you a poem now. And, <coughs> excuse me. You know, I've got tears of joy going here. Um, 
me. And God asked me, have you come here just to worship? Or is there something in it for me? <laughs> think about this. We always need something from God. Need, need, need. We never think about, uh, you know, just the bliss of, uh, of these experiences. Most people, when they pray and when they sacrifice and when they um, try to make deals with God, it's all about what you need. Um, you know, and so uh, I thought that was a beautiful line, a quote that she put in. And uh, uh, it just make, it makes me laugh every time I think about it. So, uh, so have you come here just to worship? Or is there something in it for me? You know, so uh, I'm going to leave you with that. And this has been very, very, uh, very good. And uh, the next sessions, we're going to uh, drill down on some very interesting things like conversation and ceremony. I think you're really going to like that one. It's, it's very important how we can change the world at our dinner table. And then uh, the eye of the storm, the inner circle, which is going to be very amazing um, information for you, the inner circle of your soul. It's very powerful. So uh, I'll leave you with that, and blessings to all of you, and may the uh, light of life bless you in all ways and always. So thank you very much. See you next time. Bye. All right.